4 tonight. Hosea chapter number 4. <clears throat> when you find your place in Hosea chapter number 4, say amen. All right. Yep. Hosea chapter number 4. We begin reading tonight in verse number 12 is where we're going to pick up. Last Wednesday night, we dealt with God calling the people into court, and he dealt with the nation as a whole. And last week when we left off, he dealt with the priest. And we dealt with how God rejected Jer Jeroboam's man-made religion and warned priests that their easy jobs would soon be a disaster. The night I want us to get down in verse number 12 tonight, when everybody finds their place in verse 12, say amen. amen. All right. My people ask counsel, counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err, and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. Notice this tonight. When we look at Israel sinned as a nation, the priests drifted away from doing their priestly duties, and now let's go on to an individual standpoint. It says, my people ask cancel at their stocks. When I look at this, people don't, didn't ask cancel of God. But basically at their stocks was basically they asked cancel amongst themselves. They didn't want biblical counsel, but they wanted easy listening counsel. Does that make sense tonight? Unfortunately, in today's world that we live in, not many people want... Biblical counsel. This word counsel is the same word that we get the word counselor from, and the word counselor is the same word that we get lawyer from. So they went and asked, when you need help with something, you have to ask a lawyer, legal help with something. You want to ask a lawyer, right? So if you commit a crime, what's the first thing you do? Ask for a lawyer. So these people here went and asked for counsel, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms has caused them to what? Err. When we think about the spirit here, the Bible talks about the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We also talk about the spirit of whoredoms. When it talks about the spirit here, notice it's a lower place S and not or a lower letter S and not a capital letter S. This spirit here is dealing with a bad spirit. This spirit here could be dealing with a demonic spirit. This spirit here could be dealing with a um, what's the right, a wrong. It's dealing with a wrong spirit here. But this spirit just didn't affect one person, but it affected everyone here in the book of Hosea. It said a spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err. In other words, to walk against truth, to walk away from truth. When we look, the priest had went against the truth, and when the priest went against the truth, the people went against the truth. And then they have gone a whoring from under their God. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and alms because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore, your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. When we look here in verse number 13, the priests were placing sacrifices and doing sacrifices in places that they should not have been doing them. Right? Sacrifices took place where? In the temple, right? But in what place in the temple? The holies of holies, right? They took the sacrifice behind the veil, presented that sacrifice to God. It was not a public ceremony, but it was a private ceremony. Here, the priest had begun to do their sacrificing at tops of mountains, burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. It was easy for them. One, my, question, my question would this be, why did they do it there instead of in the house of God? Let me tell you why. Because false gods weren't in the temple. False gods were out and about. So let's do it for everybody. Let's make everybody happy. Let's, let's have a community sacrificial service. 
That's basically what they had, right? So when you think about that, you have a question, Jim? Okay. I don't, not in this chapter, I don't think. I will go back and get you the answer on that, though. So, he said here, Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. So every branch of the family at this point is affected. When you think about that, the Bible talks about that the, penalty, that the curse of sin... We'll go to the second, third, and even up to the fourth generation. Now, that's a sad thing to think about, all right? And the Bible says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice harlots. Therefore, the people that do not understand shall what? Fall. When we look at this tonight, God said, I'm not going to punish them. Why do you think he wouldn't punish them? I'll tell you why. Because I believe God had turned them over to a reprobate mind. In, Ephesians, in Romans chapter number 1, you know God gives them chance after chance after chance. And then God says, I turned them over. He lets them go their way. When he lets them go their way, is there any punishment for them on this side of eternity? No. So he said that I will not punish your daughters nor spouses when they commit adultery. Them, for themselves are separated with hordes. In other words, they have chosen to separate themselves from the things of God. And I made this uh, statement last Wednesday night, is would we intentionally cheat on our spouses? No, we wouldn't, right? Now, if we wouldn't cheat on our spouses, then why would we cheat on God? God here is saying when he said they have separated for themselves are separated with whores. This is what he's saying. He is calling the idolaters whores. Okay? He's calling the false gods whores. In other words, what he's saying is, you are selling yourself to a bunch of false gods that, has, that cannot answer prayer, that cannot provide for you, that cannot do anything for you, but you're selling yourself to them so you're going out whoring after the false gods. All right? And he said, therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. I got to thinking about that. What does that mean here? Simple. Does a lost person understand the word of God? No. Can a saved person walk away from the things of God and fall into, or I wouldn't say fall, willfully sin in, in idolatry? Right? And, prostit and fall into when I say prostitution, I'm talking about with idolatry, right? But a lost person that does not understand that, who thinks that we are doing right by doing that, is going to what? Follow in our footsteps and they will what? Fall. When you think about that, look how important it would have been if Israel and the people here would have stayed with God, the people that did not understand, they would what? Have followed God. They would have understood. They would have had the light of the gospel turned on in their life. Now they have fallen because Israel has fallen. All right, everybody good on that? So not only do we deal with the priest and the people in the court, now I want to deal with the spectators in the court. Verse number 15. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot. Notice this. God said you're playing the harlot. You're selling yourself out to all of these idols. You're selling yourself out to all of these people. You're selling yourself out to all of these things for earthly gain. You're playing the harlot. Yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto where? Gilgal. God, uh, when we see this tonight, the people or the prophet, sorry, turns to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah who were carefully watching the events of Israel. Hosea is warning them, do not meddle in the affairs of Israel because their doom is sure. In other words, Judah, do not get involved. But notice what I said, and come not ye unto Gilgal. Now what is so important about Gilgal? You may want to tell me. You may know. Gilgal is the same place called Galgotha 
which is the same place of the crucifixion of Christ. He said, do not bring your sins, do not bring your uncleanness to a place that is not ready for purification. He said, stay away from it. I've got a special thing prepared. Ain't that something? God said, stay out. Neither go ye up to Beth Haven, nor swear that the Lord liveth. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. The people of Judah was to worship in Jerusalem and not go to the hill of shrines in Israel or special shrines at Gilgal and Bethel. Hosea calls Bethel Beth Haven, which means house of evil or deceit. That's what that uh, Beth Haven is. Don't go there. Why is that? Bethel means house of God. So when Bethel, a Beth Haven, was a house of deceit, but if you go back and study in the book of 1 Kings, and when, is it 1 Kings? 1 Kings 17 or 2 Kings 17? Hang on, I'll tell you. It's either 1 Kings 17 or 2 Kings 17. When Elisha and Elijah was going... And Elijah said, uh, is it 17 or 16? And Elijah, uh, help me out somebody. When Elijah and Elisha was there and Elisha was getting ready to be, tra- was getting ready to be taken off of this earth and Elisha went to Bethel, that being the house of God. Y'all remember what I'm talking about? In 1 Kings, I cannot remember, is 7, 16 or 17 if I remember correctly? But anyway, during that, it was Bethel. Now the name of Bethel has been changed to Beth Haven because the people have turned the house of God into a house of evil or a house of deceit. What does that sound like today? Modern America, right? You look at places that's causing themselves churches today, you look at people that call themselves preachers today, and they preach a false gospel. They give out a false truth. It's sad. It's a house of deceit. Moving on. Israel was like a stubborn heifer and not a submissive lamb. We know that God is the line of the tribe of what? Judah, right? We know that the line's going to lay down with the lamb, right? When we look at this, it's given... Here a picture, he said, for Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. You ever had to deal with a stubborn cow before? That's not a fun thing to do. You try to get it up in a trailer, and you'll get it almost there, and it begins to back up. They have to take a cattle prod and hit it in the hind end with it to make it move up where it needs to move, right? And if the first one don't work, you turn it up and hit them again. And if that don't work, you turn it up again to where it gets their attention. You can use them on humans too. Not that I would know anything about that. But just saying. Um, so when you look at this, he said, you're as a backsliding heifer. He said, now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. In other words, God's going to kill you. He's going to make you submissive, or not kill you, but God's going to make you submissive. And when he does, he's going to feed you as a lamb. And then the ber- verse number 18, the Bible says, Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her, or, her rulers with shame do love give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their, what? Sacrifices. You know what I see here? I see God's whirlwind of judgment. God here is judging his people. He says here that the wind hath bound her up in her wings. You think about that. A, a, you, I look at it as it is a tornado coming in. And the wind just sucks you up and will dispose of you. Everybody good on that? All right, moving on. Chapter number 5 tonight. I don't think I have a slide for chapter number 5. So if you brought your Bibles tonight, chapter number 5. Everybody good? Say amen. 
All right, verse number one. Hear ye this, O priest, and hearken ye, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you, because ye have been a snare on mitzvah, and a net spread upon Tabor. We see here that this is a... This is a summons of the evidence the judge has applied to all the accused. He condemned the leaders for trapping innocent people and exploiting them. He says here, hear this, ye old priest. Notice this tonight. I'm going to give you this real quick. Hear, this, hear ye this, O priest. Who did God start his judgment with? The man of God. The Bible says in judgment must begin where? At the house of God. When God's judgment started out, he didn't go to Gomer. He didn't go to the nation. He started with the priest. He said, gentlemen, you did not do your jobs. Then God dealt with, he said, the priest, hearken ye the house of Israel. So then he deals with the people. He goes to the priest and to the people. Now, why did he deal with? With the king last. Because the church and the people reflected what type of king they had. Does that make sense tonight? Our churches, our, our country is in terrible shape tonight because our churches are in terrible shape tonight. And the reason we have who we have in the White House, and we could say it's a stolen election or whatever, but it is because the people of God are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. We've got slack, we got easy, we've got lazy. We're not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. When you think about that, you look at was Oklahoma introduced the Ten Commandments in their schools, Louisiana introduced the Bible in their schools, the state of Tennessee recently said July 1st started every day with fasting and praying for our nation for the entire month. When you look at these three states, you say those are good things. Yeah, but what about the other states that surround them? That's not doing. Why aren't we encouraging our leaders, our governor, our, to say, hey, why not the state of North Carolina begin to pray and fast? Right? Well, let me tell you why. Because the churches aren't ready to do so. So God here dealt with the people. God dealt with the priest, the people. And then the power. He dealt here with the ruler. He said, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you. Judgment began with the men of God. Judgment began with the people of God. And then judgment dealt with the, with the power. He condemned. He, uh, there was no justice in the land. They were sinking deep in sin and lacked the power to repent and turn back to God. For their sin had paralyzed them. You know what is wrong with our country tonight is sin has paralyzed us. We don't think sin affects us like it affects everybody else. Right? We sit back and we've, because we have watered down God and brought God down to a humanistic level, because we have watered down the things of God and hurt them, the people of God or the people in this world have no fear of God because they have no respect for his power, for his authority, for his word. And their sin has paralyzed them. There's, we have let sin enter into the house of God. We've let sin enter into the pulpits. And people are sitting on the sidelines saying, my sin's not hurting everybody else around me. It's just hurting me. No, it affects everyone. Notice this tonight. Adam and Eve sin didn't just affect them, but it, infect, it infected, not affected, infected an entire world. Right? Notice this. Gomer, her sin of being a prostitute, it's a nice way to put it, being a prostitute didn't just affect her, but it affected a whole nation. God likened the nation of Israel to a prostitute standing on the street. Now that's sad to think about. Moving on. Why didn't they 
Why didn't they respect the Lord? He said in verse 2, And the revolters, revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuke of them all. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hid from me. For now, Ephraim, thou committest whoredom, and Israel is defied. They thought they could hide their sin from God. The Bible says, be sure your sin will what? Find you out. The Bible says what's done in secret, God will reveal how? Openly. So today we can look at this and we say, well, I've got my little sin covered from God. Nobody knows about it. No, that's not true. How many times did David go up on the housetop and look at Bathsheba? More than once. Now, I'm not, I'm not blaming Bathsheba for what happened. It takes two, all right? But do you not think after the first or second time Bathsheba looked up and seen David looking down? No doubt she timed it, right? It takes two. If I'd have seen it, I'd have waited and showered at a different time of day, right? When we think about this tonight, he said here, you cannot hide from me. You cannot hide from God. You can't hide anything from God. God knows everything. Adam and Eve, Lord walked into the garden. You know, God could have walked, when he walked into the garden, could have walked straight to Adam and Eve. He knew exactly where they was at. Adam and Eve, where art thou? We're behind the tree, Lord. Why are you behind that tree? Because we're naked. Who told you you was naked? Well, the serpent did. No. Well, the woman thou gavest me did. No. When we sin and we want to truly repent, we cannot blame our husbands, we cannot blame our wives, we cannot blame other people in the church. We can only blame who? Ourselves. We blame the devil for a lot of stuff we bring on ourselves. Don't give the devil credit. If you sin, don't say, well, the only reason I sin is because the devil tempted me. No, you sin because you yielded to the temptation the devil offered you. You had an opportunity to say no. Tonight, if Jim was to bring me a line of crack cocaine, Jim, you didn't know you was a drug dealer, did you? And Jim poured it out right here in the prettiest line of white snow you ever seen. Hunter Biden would sniff it before he got it out. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry, that was wrong. And he put it up here and he said, Preacher, I want you to try this and it will not hurt you. And I pull out a $100 bill. That's what you're supposed to do with, right? And you roll it up. And you know what? And I said, you know what, Jim? I believe I'll take you up on it. And it was laced with fentanyl, and he didn't know it. And it overdosed me and killed me. Whose fault is that, Jim's or mine? It's mine. Because I partook in what he offered. So today, when we sin, why do we say, well, the devil caused me to do it? No. He didn't. You chose to do it. The people here could not pin their blame on anybody because God said, I see you. Moving on. He said, they will not frame from their doings to turn unto their God. Now, that's a sad state of affairs. A nation that is God's, nation, God's chosen nation, right? And people that are God's chosen people would not refrain from their doings to turn unto their God. They say, God, forget you. We would rather have our sin and our pleasure in our sin. We do not need you. The same God that led them in the wilderness for 40 years the same God that led them across the Red Sea, the same God that poured manna out of heaven and gave them meat to eat, the same God that gave them water to drink, the same God that performed miracle after miracle after miracle, is the same God they said, we don't need you anymore. Look at that in your own life as a Christian tonight. The same God that saved you by his grace, the same God that has loved you unconditionally, and we willfully sin and we're, we're too proud to say, God, I messed up. God, I, I, I yielded to the devil. God, I willfully sin. Don't pull it at him and say, well, the woman thou gave us me. Or the serpent. Just say, God, I did it. When we say this, when we see this, God here said, this, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them. And... 
They have not known who? The Lord. What happened here was a generation came up during this which knew not God because the priests failed to preach the truth and the people failed to obey the truth and a whole generation came up without the truth. Does that make sense tonight? Moving on. And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah shall, all, shall fall with them. Preacher, what do you see here in verse number 5? And the pride of Israel does testify to his face. God is looking down and Israel is saying, God, look at us. We're sinning. God, look at us. We're proud of what we're doing. We just come out of what month? June. June's known as what? Pride month. What are they doing? They're proud of their what? Sin. Yes, sir. Oh, God. That ain't good. And I hope there's enough people to say no. But they call it Pride Month. They're proud of what God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for doing. They are proud of what God destroyed this earth under Noah in Noah's day for doing. Right? God killed the whole nation, killed all the people except for eight. For this same very thing, our pride is lifted up. Verse number seven, verse number six, they shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not, ooh, notice this, find him. He hath withdrawn himself from them. God said, I've been here the entire time. Y'all have said no. But the minute that you get in desperation and you want me, you're not going to be able to find me. It goes over to Isaiah chapter number 55 and verse number 6. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be what found. Call ye upon him while he is near. God always isn't near. You know, that's the dangerous thing for a sinner. God comes and knocks on our heart's door and say, Dear Lord, and the Lord says, hey, sinner friend, you need to give your heart and life to me. Not tonight, Lord. But it may be six months from now and God's not knocking on their heart's door and they want God to knock on their heart's door and God's nowhere to be found. Moving on, verse number eight. Or verse number seven. They have dealt treacherously against the Lord. For they have begotten strange children. Now shall a mouth devour them with their, or shall a month devour them with their portions. Blow ye the cornet of Gibeah and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Haven after thee, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. And the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. The princes of Judah were like them that remove the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like what? Water. God's judgment is given here. He said, you're guilty. A day of judgment was coming when the sites or cities of Israel would be conquered by an invading Assyrian army. The citizens would be taken into captivity. Ephraim would be, a waste, would be laid waste on the day of reckoning. The inner decay of a nation was like a slow hidden destruction caused by a moth. Say, so where do you get that? Go with me to verse number 11. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the what? Commandment. He walked, that word after basically means it's the same thing as against. Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a what? Moth. Now a moth is a little thing, right? They're, but what can they do? They can destroy, right? Moth gets in your closet. It can destroy clothes, right? God said the moth here is going to come out. And to the house of Judah... 
as rottenness. When I think about the rottenness here, what do you see here? I think about termites coming in. Termites eat wood. Why do they, what, how do they thrive in the wood that they eat? Easy. The wood has to be damp, right? So that means it has to be soft. And then termites get in and they begin to eat away. And as they begin to eat away, the moisture from the wet wood begins to spread to the drier wood and makes it that much more easier. And you cannot hear them doing their work, but they are a little small thing that does a big, powerful work. This sin here was small in their eyes, but it destroyed them. Verse number 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob, yet he could not heal you nor cure you of your wound. You know, when I think about wounds tonight, I think about diabetics. I think a good thing to think about, but diabetics tonight cannot heal properly. What's one of the hardest things to heal on a diabetic? A wound, right? It takes a long time for that wound to heal and to heal properly. And if that wound isn't taken care of properly, it can become infected. And here Ephraim said, I've got an open wound and I need some help with it. There was no help for it. When we see this tonight, both Ephraim and Judah were unavoidable and brought to ruin. Israel and Judah were sick nations, but instead of turning to the Lord for healing, they both turned to the king of Assyria for help. What they needed, God had. What they wanted was help. They didn't want out of their sin. There's a lot of people tonight that want help in their sin, but they don't want out of their sin, Right? The rich man in hell lifted up his eyes being in torment. Did he ask Lazarus, hey, get me out of hell? No, he said, I just want a drop of water so that I can be comforted in this flame. He didn't want out. He wanted help. Israel and Ephraim, they did not want out of their sin. They wanted help while they continued in their sin. The Bible says in verse 14, For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah, I, even I, I will tear and go away, and I will take away, and none shall rescue him. And I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me how early. When we see this tonight, God here will withdraw himself these people needed prayer and repentance, but instead they trusted in politics and useless treaties. And all the Lord could do was withdraw himself and wait for them to seek his face in truth and humility. When I think about that tonight, I'm done. I'm going to stop right there. We'll get chapter number six next week. When I look at chapter number five here and think about the Lord withdrawing himself, my sister the other week, I told y'all, my sister ain't the smartest person in the world, right? My sister the other week got in an argument with my dad and told my dad to shut up. So he did for about four days. Day one, this happened. My daddy called me and my daddy was upset. My daddy told me what had happened. He said, so you know what I'm going to do? I said, what? He said, I'm going to shut up. I said, oh, Lord, this is not going to be good. Well, my sister calls me on day two and said, Hey, I tried calling Daddy last night, and he didn't answer his phone. Do you know what's going on with him? I said, No, I ain't. I don't really know. It ain't like none of my business. And I told Daddy, I said, If she calls and asks me, it's none of my business. I'm staying out of it. He's okay. No, I ain't heard nothing. Day three goes by. Hey, I tried calling Daddy three or four times yesterday. Do you know what's going on with him? No. I don't. don't know. Day f- Four, same thing. No, I ain't heard nothing. Day five, silence breaks. And my sister called Daddy and said, I think I figured out what happened. And he, she said, what? He, she said, I told you to shut up. And I'm sorry. You know what had happened? Daddy had to withdraw himself 
to show her her iniquity. When we sin, we are so brazen in our sin sometimes that God has to withdraw himself so we'll come to the end of ourselves to realize that nothing else can help us but him. The prodigal son's father did not go down to the hog pen and stand there by the hog pen with his son and say, hey, I need you to come back home. Did he? He didn't stand there and say, hey, let me feed you. Let me give you some more money. Let me take care of you. Let me clothe you. Let me do all that. No, he stayed home while the prodigal hit rock bottom. But the minute that the prodigal needed him, the father was there waiting for him. The same thing here at the end of chapter number five. When Israel realized they needed God, he was there waiting for them. But he had to withdraw himself for them to realize that they needed him. So think about that tonight. All right, any questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir.